Funding for this program was provided in part by the RE Synergy Foundation. Content for the sustainable world. My dad was an old school surgeon who always wished he was a rancher and a man who took life by the horns and ran with it. Think John Wayne meets Ernest Hemingway meets Teddy Roosevelt. One thing that always embarrassed me, though, was that if my dad saw something interesting wherever he was, he'd go ask about it. He'd start up impromptu conversations with perfect strangers about crop rotation, cattle genetics, or how to get all those pieces of firewood in the load to stay on top of that one little donkey. I was mortified as a kid. Well, I grew up, and now that's me. I married a perfect man with itchy feet who loves all things music and film and who makes documentaries just for the love of it. If you dump all of those things into a Petri dish and let them stew for 25 years of blissful chaos, what do you get? Well, welcome to my life of vicarious agriculture. Come on along for the ride. We've got the goats for cashmere, for meat, for milk, for milk for beauty products that we're looking at. This is another project, but also <laughs> for farm education and agritourism. So that's where I've just been to the local school. So what we're doing is we're renting out the goats and our service. So the goats stay on site for the whole school term and they use the goats for not just like rural skills education, but they're, they're factoring them into their basic like arithmetic and biology. And, you Makes know, it interesting, does it not? Yeah, so it's part of like their outdoor education um, skills. That's so, brilliant. Yeah, so, that, so I think, you know, for farmers who want to have sort of more niche animals, near rare breeds, rare, um, native breeds, like they have to look at these different, explore these different income streams. And it's, you know, it's great for education purposes, but at the end of the day, it all has to stack up for the farm yes, farmer. Very so, definitely. Okay, so we've been here talking for the last couple minutes. Would you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, I'm uh, Gillian McEwen from Loonan Bay Farm here in Scotland. Now, Loonan Bay, why, why did you pick that name? So we're based at a lovely area on the coast. It's uh, three miles of basically secluded beach, which we can always pop down and have a look, Pearly Rover. And um, we've got two two locations down at Loonan Bay on the beach. And we've also got the my husband's family farm, which is based about a mile away. So yeah, it's a unique ecosystem here because in a region of Angus, um, you've got the coast, you've got quite a small region. Um, you've got the, you can travel from the coast up to the glens, which is part of the Cairngorms within 40 minutes. So you're really getting the best of both worlds. Yes. So we're lucky because we live down by the beach and we can enjoy sort of secluded area this they're completely you know if i meet someone else on the beach in the morning i'm like oh this is awful busy today <laughs> <laughs> so yeah we're quite it's quite quiet here which is nice but you know you can jump in the car and be up the glens and you know top of a Mon monroe within an hour so it's, it's you get the best of both worlds We are standing in the midst, having this conversation in the midst of a field of, now you said Scottish cashmere goats. Yes. That's not necessarily a breed. It's goats that you raise in Scotland. Is that how you would put it? Yeah, that's what we'd put. There's not a, an official breed over here. Um, we're actually the only farm in the whole of the UK that has Scottish cashmere goats. And um, it was one of these things that happened by pure chance. We didn't start out to rear cashmere goats but it kind of just happened that way and um, we discovered back in the 90s there was a project um, where the, gov the government funded a project for uh, hill farmers traditionally that had sheep up in the up in the glens to start integrating some cashmere goats for fibre production and this was a project that ran for over 10-15 years it involved um, academics who were studying the fibre um, and they had their own breeding programmes internally within their institution. So the same hills that we see the sheep yeah, on? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. So if you'd come back, if you'd been here in the 90s, you'd probably seen maybe up to sort of 5,000 goats up in these hills. There was about 1,000 um, producers that were all working as a cooperative and consolidating their fibre because as you probably know you get you don't really get much fibre from cashmere's it's, power in numbers right yeah exactly yes. um and you know that that was an, uh, an initiative that was really to try and um produce our own homegrown scottish fibre because you know for for generations we've had the mills here and you know the innovation and 
has, a, has been there in terms of the pr process inside of it. And we've still got some fantastic mills like Johnson's of Elgin, um, who are going strong and, you know, still working in the local community. Um, but the, um, unfortunately, after about 15 years, the projects sort of fizzled out for numerous reasons. Um, you know, back the, then, there wasn't the same sort of luxury brands market as there, there was. Um, there was a lot of farmers that were getting subsidies for sheep, but not for goats. Nobody really lobbied um, at government level for, for goats. And it's the same now. You know, there's, there's a lot of these agri um, livestock schemes coming in and they're all for ruminants but goats aren't included. So, you know, you don't get the same support. So, now, yeah. When you say scheme, in, to, in the United States, when we use the word scheme, it has a negative connotation uh, somewhat. Okay. But here, that's more like a program that everybody yeah, does. Is that so, right? So it's, it's like, um, you know, the government will support farmers as long as you follow um, a specific pro program. So, for example, we're, we're involved in an agri-ecological um, scheme where we're trying to support um, some of the native breeds that, of birds that have been in decline mm. um, and we're provided by uh, various tools to help us do that such as bird seed and um, certain crops that we can plant that's going to support nature um, so, and but there's other ones where the government actually funding you to, to you know supporting you um, but there's big changes afoot with the, with us uh, with the UK coming out of Brexit unfortunately okay. um, we now, uh, the whole subsidy scheme is up in the air. Um, that all came from the EU. So there's a lot of uncertainty at the moment for farmers. I mean, we've always gone off and done our own thing anyway and not been reliant on the government as much. We, we, we Scottish, <laughs> we, your family, well, we, Britain. Well, both, um, but <laughs> us personally, um, we've just, because we know that we can sell our products direct to consumers, um, we we all we don't tend to have it have an issue with you know reliant too much on grants you know they are ha they are really helpful at times but we tend to just go off and do do our own thing <laughs> and uh, that's why we ended up with goats and you know we're seeing every day how the environmental benefits they're bringing and there's a lot of as you said earlier you've not seen many goats in the uk have not at all um and farmers are just waking up to how useful the, these um animals are because you know they're grazers not browsers so you know they're going to go if you I'm wandering to hear about they go um, after the brush and not the yeah, grass exactly so like this this is the remnants these tufts here are the remnants of docks now for a cattle farmer and even a sheep farmer they're the blight of a for them because their animals will leave leave the docks behind whereas the goats have gone in and they're annihilating these and it's all about you know that creating that that better pasture environment which is going to support um, biodiversity as well, well and we've, yeah we've been working a little bit with the american goat federation in the states and one of the things that they're trying to to get across to people right now is that um, they're writing this little uh, book or they've already written called the cattleman's guide to raising sheep or to raising goats and cattle. Yeah. So basically they, they're talking about the, the lack of competition between the cattle mm -hmm. and the goats. If yeah. you can run them on the same piece of property, it diverses, diversifies your income stream. Yeah. But people don't really think about it. So you look at it here and everybody says, oh, sheep are the only thing. No. Or even cattle are the thing. Yeah. You could put them on a field like this mm -hmm. and they're not going to compete, no, correct? That's right. Um, they're not going to compete for the the, t the plants, but also they do, a lot of them don't share the same worms as well. Yes. So you've got that added benefit. Um, so, you know, it'd be great to do more with um, other farmers on multi-species grazing. Um, you know, I think there's huge benefits. Um, you know, we can see here the difference that the goats have made. Um, we've we've rented some of our goats out to the local college. <laughs> Is she having a nibble? She's having a nibble. That's okay. It's entertainment, right? <laughs> we've rented our goats to the local college, and we put them into a woodland area for some conservation grazing, and that avoided them having to go in with like machinery and pesticides. Yes. And you know, they got through the brambles. That, yeah. You know, that would. Have they would really struggle to clear that. Yeah, they're trying to do it in California with the fires because the yeah. brush is the first thing that goes up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So but, it, but again, environmental 
issues remain and that's been the big concern is oh is that bad for the environment and i am an environmentalist yeah, yeah. and yet i can see the sense that something like this with four hooves mm -hmm. that actually replenishes the carbon by the manure it spreads as yep. it goes through it might not be a bad thing correct yeah that's correct and there's also you know a different chemical component in the manure of goats as well um compared to other livestock so being able to work work with them in syn synergy um I think is a good way to support the environment, um, but it has to be well managed. That's the key, because anyone I speak to will say, oh, you've got goats, they escape all the time, they eat everything, and I'm like, that is a common misconception. So if you provide a goat with a lot of interesting diversity in the field, you don't just give, give them a field of grass. Yep. You know, This field was actually planted with herbal lays, which was a, a mixture of multi-species legumes. Um, we've got things, it's passed now, but this field was beautiful. It had um, chicory, so it was just in flower a couple of weeks ago. So it was beautiful corn blue flowers. And that's like a natural wormer for the goats. So ah. they'll self-medicate. You know, if they're thinking, oh, I feel a little bit upset stomach, or they'll go in and start nibbling on the chicory. So I think it's all about what we've learned over the last six years, all about the pasture management. Mm. Um, we do rotational grazing, although we haven't done any in this field because the pasture's been so good, <laughs> we've not needed to. Um, but as it starts to die off, we will segment the field with electric fencing. Yep. So they're getting smaller areas to graze on and we'll, and we'll move them um, every couple of days. Um, we, we, we trialled that out a couple of years ago and we really seen the benefits. It was great for the goat's gut health. You know, you're, you're moving them onto fresh pastures, so they're reducing that worm burden. So, mm. you know, one of the goat, goat's biggest issues um, is that they, they can be, have issues with worms. Mm. So, you know, that can have lots of kind of detrimental effects on their health. Yeah. Um, so I see you have, this is four strand, right? Well, one at the bottom. It looks like three, but there's one at the very bottom. Yeah, Because yeah. I, I know they do like to crawl underneath the little ones. Yeah. Too. So this is this is your electric fencing, yep. four strand. You just have it sectioned off in this large area. Tell me, do the, do the cashmeres have the same requirements, basically, as the boars? Because you've brought boars in as well. Yeah, um, I would say the cashmeres, there's less inputs required. You know, if you were to go up the west coast of Scotland into the wilds and go on, on some of the islands, the goats that you would see are cashmere goats. So they have evolved, you know, to have the, these long shaggy coats to keep them warm in the winter. They obviously grow the cashmere as an extra layer of insulation in the winter months. Um, their hoofs need less trimming than boars. Um, you know, they're just much lower maintenance. You know, we love our boars. But yeah, they are prima donnas, some of them. <laughs> <laughs> and I hear they can be a little, a little more challenging sometimes on the mothering side of things. And yeah. It depends on the strain you get, I believe. But. Yeah, I mean, we've, uh, the good thing about our goats is we don't really have to do too much intervention. We bring them into the sheds over the winter time so we can keep a good eye on them. Um, and nine times out of 10, if anyone needs help, it's one of the boars. <laughs> um, I had one boar, Trixie, Last year, she threw herself onto the ground in labour and started flailing her arms. I've never seen anything like it. Arms flailing about, legs flailing. And I thought, what are you doing? And, <laughs> you know, she's not a first-time mum. And, you know, the kids came out, no bother. And she was quite happy. But, yeah, you never see... Where you find the cashmere just, like, go off into a corner, a few little pushes, and then two lovely little twins straight on the teat <laughs> within, you know, 10 minutes... Um, so yeah, they're definitely. I would. I we found they're, they're lower maintenance, but we love our boars as well. Well, There's, you can't. It's my understanding that the boars have the best bone to meat ratio and bone structure out there. You can't really get a goat that that gets more mass on it than yeah, them. Is that, that, is that, that right? That, that is right. I mean, there are some other meat breeds like the Kiko that are kind of come. You know, that are starting to be a bit more comparable. But yeah, we found that yeah, if you're raising a meat goat. It's the, it's the boars that are really kind of like the Aberdeen Angus of the goat, goat world, goat meat world. Um, but sometimes you can't, you, you know, it's, it's, um, it's beneficial to take and make a new mix if you choose to do so. And I know we, we were on a farm uh, called Back Acres uh -huh. back in the New England area. And they, they have boars and they are raising, I think, Kikos. Is that right? Or cashmeres? 
cashmeres. Yeah. So, the, but the challenge oftentimes when you mm -hmm. have a fiber goat is it's great to have that bulk and that mass of, of bone structure, mm -hmm. but you do lose something in the quality of the fiber, right? Sometimes if you're not very, very careful, you don't get the mix just right. Yeah, that, so that's tell me about it. that. That's it. I mean, you're either really breeding for fiber or for meat. I think it's, it's difficult to try and get the best quality from both ends of the spectrum. So originally we set out just to be goat meat producers and we crossed the boar goats with the cashmere because we we're looking for a goat that was hardier. You know, we've, we don't have lots of rain here, but it can be wet and windy in the winter. So we needed to find a goat that could withstand the, the climate here, but also produce a really good carcass at the end of the day. So that's why we decided to cross our cashmeres with our boars. Since then, we've gone down the route of now splitting the herd into two to find groups. And um, we have the cashmere herd and, and the boar. And um, we're now moving away from, from the meat side. And that's purely down to lack of infrastructure in Scotland. You know, we've got local abattoirs um, closing all the time. Um, so it is a real challenge. Our focus now is, is mainly on producing the best fiber herd um, that we can. And, you know, it's, it's a shame because there is a huge market for goat meat in this country. Um, we've got lots of, like the States, we've got lots of immigrants who have different uh, cuisines and traditions and um, I've got no shortage of offers for, for my goat meat, but unfortunately, you know, our abattoirs, uh, local abattoirs that will take rare breeds and native breeds are closing because the small abattoirs are treated the same as these factory style abattoirs where it's all down to bureaucracy. They have admin, um, you know, they have, they have all this um, levels of admin thrown upon them by the government and you know, all they're trying to do is do a, a good job for the, for the animals and for the producers and it's just it's too challenging for yeah. them. So yeah. In the States the same yeah. way, it's, it, it's funny that you can do everything else beautifully and at the very end where you want to either get the product, whether that be fiber or meat, mm -hmm. you want to get that to the consumer, that's the hardest part of the whole thing. Yep. Yep. Uh -huh. And it's and yet it stops everything up. So if you're trying to get a cow slaughtered in New England, sometimes yeah. it's two years out. Yeah. In some areas. I know. So do they allow mobile slaughter here? There was talk about it on some of the islands on the, in Scotland, um, but it's they've been talking about it for years, for decades, mm -hmm. and it's just the same. It goes round and round, and nothing seems to come out of it. There, the latest was there was a government survey that went out a couple of months ago to say what do you think should be done and yeah it's just it's just challenging times you know we had a really good um, facility which was run by farmers they were taken in small breeds native breeds rare breeds they did the putchery the ha everything was done on site it was an organic farm and they couldn't get it to work you know after seven years they had to close because of all the bureaucracy um, they also have to bring in um, vets, which have, you know, for the welfare side of it. And vets would be traditionally coming over from the EU. But since we left the EU two years ago, then a lot of these vets are just, they're not coming over anymore. So um, there was a shortage of labour in that regards. And also the butchers, nobody wants to be a butcher anymore. So it is, it's just challenging. Um, and... You know, I, I'd, I'm, I'd love to go out and convince more farmers to, you know, sell direct and, you know, be able to connect with their community because that's another part of regenerative farming. It's like bridging the gap between your local community and the farms, like what it was like years ago. Um, but it is challenging when that infrastructure and the supply chain just isn't there. Um, and it's the same with the mills with the cashmere. So... Yeah, you're kind of up against it, but you keep going because it's, you know, you love what you're doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you you have quite a quite a, a scientific approach to it, yeah. right? Tell me a little bit about your background and your husband's background. So I'm not from a farming family, um, a farming background. I was a scientist working in biotech and pharma for 15 years. Um, and I married my husband, uh, who was based on a farm, but running a trans their family transport business from the farm. So he was never really involved too much in the farming side. And then the opportunity came for us to both to get involved in it. And um, I just thought, you know, let's try something different here. And it's been, 
it's been really good because I'm coming with fresh eyes and same with my husband, we're not going down the conventional route. That's why, you know, we, we study everything, we study the, the, the wildlife, the soil, um, the fibres, you know, it's good to have that sort of analytical approach to it. And systems theory, because it all works within a system. So like you were speaking of earlier, you can have all the other parts in the beginning, but if the end part is not there, it's going to throw everything out of whack, no matter how beautifully all the first, the, the beginning components yeah, can yeah, be. Yeah. So to think about, about farming as a system, including the back end economic factor, I would think would be very much your strong suit. Yeah, I think you need to th think about it holistically, the story that you're going to try and tell as well from the start to beginning. Um, for me, it's been an educational experience learning all about farming and I'm keen to share that and show to people, this is actually really hard work, <laughs> but it's actually really rewarding. You know, you're, a day like this where it's blue skies, it's beautiful. Thank you for ordering that, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> we're standing out in, the, in a field with chilled out goats and you know, there is that therapeutic side of it. I like to educate um, people about what we're doing because I'm learning as well. And, you know, we're, we're, things are moving into regenerative agriculture here. Um, so it is, it's learning for everyone. And, you know, having no preconceptions, misconceptions about how things are done and just giving it a go. Um, but yeah, also being able to, to do the sales and marketing side at the, at the end, because, you know, <sighs> There's so many good things happening in the farming community, but they're not great at sell, telling that story. Yes, the niche market is a beautiful thing yes. because it's the entire, you're not just buying a pair of socks, you're buying this whole history of the farm and the farmer and the moment in the sun yeah. on the eastern side of Scotland, yeah. right? That's what you're buying when you buy yeah. a pair of socks. Exactly. And you're, you know, you're supporting these farmers who genuinely want to do things right for their livestock, for their, the environment, for nature for generations to come. So I think it's so important that kids know where their food comes from, how fibre's produced, and then they pass that on through the generations. Cause that has been lacking, I think in the last generation, certainly my generation. Let me just ask, you're running your boars with the cashmere here together, but just the, is this all the females here? Yes, yeah, these are all females. I know you, <laughs> I know you. She's the petted one. Yes, I can tell, <laughs> I can tell. <laughs> So, uh, look at this luscious hair. I guess now is the time for me to ask, now yeah. that you've got one here. Tell me a little bit about cashmere on a goat. So at this time of year, um, the goat is just starting to produce our cashmere for the winter. You know, we're, at the, we're going into the autumn time. Um, we'll start to see underneath, we've got the outer coat, which is made up of guard hair. Um, this girl here is a good example of like really long guard hair which is what, what we like because it's protecting the cashmere underneath. So in the winter months, the cashmere is basically just an undercoat that the goat grows. Apparently it was an adaptive response for when the goats were up in the Himalayas. You need a coat to keep them warm, but the goats needs to be agile enough to take off in case a predator, you know, mountain lion wants to come and, <laughs> yep. and attack, attack them. So it's the finest and the lightest yet warmest fiber you can, that's available um, so it's at this time of year they're just starting to grow there's nothing yeah there's not much it's just that little fine baby down here yeah yeah ah. and what you'll find is as we go into the winter months um, they start to grow almost sort of ringlets and you tend to see more of them around the neck where it's more exposed um, and ideally what you're looking for in cashmere is a really fine mi microns um, your so really fine fine fiber which you can send off to be tested and um, and they'll and also the curvature so how crimped the ca cashmere is ideally you want the, <laughs> she's in the way <laughs> ideally you want the cashmere to be like really quite tightly um crimped because it's hiding the staple underneath the guard mm. guard the staple is the length of the the fibre. Um, so you want the cashmere to be protected underneath the guard hair throughout the winter months. Um, so it's not damaged, it's not exposed to the elements. So this girl is a perfect example. Um, so when it comes to the springtime, any time between May and um, June, they'll start naturally casting. So if we hand brush our goats, some people shear their goats, um, but so far we've been hand brushing ours 
and it allows us just to remove all the cashmere when the goats are re ready to molt. So it's all, it's all based on daylight hours. Um, so as we go into the longer spring days, um, there'll be a hormonal cascade that will trigger, trigger the cashmere to drop and it says to the goats, we don't need, don't need it anymore, we're going into the su summer. And if they were just left out in the wild, they would be rubbing their cashmere off on fences and trees. So it benefits the goat as well. Do they actually enjoy being yeah. being combed? Um, but this is also one of those reasons why it's important to educate the consumer. Because I now I have looked at your website, and you do have things for sale. One of them is a cashmere scarf that's absolutely beautiful. Yeah. It's a two hundred dollars scarf. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Which is pretty pricey. Yeah. According to some, you know, some standards, I, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but. But again, if you're only getting a little bit, this is an incredibly soft garment. Yeah, exactly. And you're only getting a little bit when you take care of a sheep. That's the value of the product. Yeah. You and have to charge that yeah, in these circumstances. And I think that's why we need to educate people about cashmere production because, you know, traditionally it's done in China and Mongolia. And, um, you know, that was part of the Mongolians' like nomadic tradition was to move throughout the land with their goats and um, but because of this huge demand for for cashmere um everything's been scaled up and china got in in the act as well now and you know there's they are trying to make improvements on the standards and sustainability mm. but there are these detrimental effects on the environment because of scaling up the numbers of goats that you need to produce these cash to, to, to feed the demand for cashmere um, one of the approaches that we're taking that's slightly different is taking our cashmere and blending it with wool that's from native breeds such as Shetland. Um, we've also been working with some Scottish merino producers um, in order to create really fine, fine fibre products. Um, but make our cashmere go a bit further as well. And we see it as being a, a, a kind of different approach that you know, back in the 90s when the Scottish Cashmere Project was running, their plan, their, their, uh, they produced 100% cashmere products. We just think, for us to do that, you need to have thousands, you know, hundreds of thousands of goats. So what can we do that fits in well with our farm and our ethos and certainly blending our cashmere with other, um, you know, fabulous fibres that should be, you know, brought to the forefront yeah. um, and explaining the story behind behind it all. As being a, a, a person that's excellent niche marketing, obviously, you have not only done that 100% cashmere scarf, but you, you actually got picked up here recently by a, a, a company in the United States, correct? Yeah, yeah. Tell me about that. So it was one of these bizarre situations where um, the cashmere fashion brand based in LA, the elder statesman, discovered us through Instagram, you know, the modern, the modern world of social media, um, wanted to come, reached out to us, said, can we come over? And initially it was just going to be um, meet the producers and um, do a little bit of a photo shoot. Then it turned in, out to them sourcing our cashmere Shetland um, blend. And they came out with just a, a kind of very small capsule um, sock collection. I last saw those Christmas. socks. I know. It's pretty wild. And it was it was really an experience. They came over. We did the photo shoot down on the beach. It was absolutely beautiful. And we had some goats on the beach, which was a bit <laughs> random, wearing cashmere scarves. Um, but yeah, it was brilliant, and the feedback was was tremendous. You know, and what what we're finding, almost every week, I'm contacted by another. Um, knitwear designer or a brand who really wants to source ethical regenerative yeah. fibre and it is the way things are going and um, the, the customer demand is there for it and even with these luxury brands they, they need they understand that people are willing to pay that bit more if they know that it's been responsibly sourced and yeah, yes um, so yeah there's it's it's really exciting to be involved in it all. I think that we're on the cusp of a change, and um, there is clear um, clearly a market, and it's just encouraging other farmers to say, you know, start to, to start to produce fibre from start to utilise the fibre that you've got. You know, we've got millions of sheep all over Scotland, um, but very little people doing much with the fibre. But again, it comes back to infrastructure. We need the mills. To produce the quality. I mean, half of our cashmere goes to processing, so it's fifty percent of that's lost. lost. So you need really good producer processors that know what they're doing. Mm. 
products because at the end of the day you want your product to be the best example of your fiber um so yeah it's bringing all that back because we did have it <laughs> yes and well, it used to be just the way of things right yeah, yeah. and now it is very definitely that the mass market has completely changed our agricultural system yeah and if we do not support small farming mm -hmm. small agriculture at the actual value of the thing it will be gone yeah yeah because there's no way you can stay in business mm -hmm. if people don't support you mm -hmm. and then it's going to be one big warehouse store Thank you for bringing us out here. We really appreciate it. It's yeah. been lovely. Nice meeting you. Thank Thanks you for coming. Well. Nice, to, nice to have you visit in this part of the world. It's delightful. <laughs> we'll be back. <laughs> Good stuff. <laughs>